Hi everyone and welcome to Fresh from the Studio. We are excited to hear today from three artists, um, Cheryl Fenfrock, Anna Fritzel, and Angel Foss. Um, Fresh from the Studio is a program where women in their work, member artists and alumni, um, share what they are working on in short presentations. They can be live studio visits, PowerPoints, um, it can take on many different forms, including a virtual exhibition that we'll start with, with uh, Cheryl Fenfrock. So I'll let you take it away. Uh, hi, everyone, and thanks for having me. Um, let me jump in and share my screen. One moment. Oops. And I'll take us over here. Um, first of all, I want to tell you I'm here at my home office. I've got some current work that I'll show you later that's over here for background. And I wanted to share with you a show that I just did at Row 2 Gallery in Dallas, The Ties That Bind. It was a solo show. So I made a virtual gallery and I thought it'd be fun to show you some work that way. So let's go in and we'll take a look. And we've got people here, but we'll make we'll make it private. We'll get rid of the people. <laughs> Always love that. So let's go. Let's see. I thought I was going big. There we go. This is big. Woo. All right. So this um, body of work is called the ties that bind, and it started with exploring exploring the fact that I use thread and rope in a lot of my pieces. So I created a series of three uh, about the Greek fates in mythology. And these are the spinners. This first one is she spins the thread of human life. So she's making the thread. And um, I've got these kind of houses in development as well. And then I've got the next one, which is the allotter who measures the thread. And she's got her tape measure and she's kind of got a tape measure for hands as well and her assortment of different threads. And I'm referring back to with kind of this brick look, uh, something linear kind of referencing measurement to go along with the idea of the thread allotted and just measurement. And then finally, we get to the end of these three. And this is the cutter who's got the scissors here, who cuts the thread of human life, almost like the dreaded cutter, or there are other, other aspects of ending as well. So I'm playing around with narration, storylines, and just basically working with uh, different characters and figures. I'm influenced by media, photographs, sometimes photographs that I take, and anything potentially that I see could end up in a painting or jumping off space. So I'll take a look at a few more here. And let's see if this thing will spin around for me to give you a scope. All right, this is the largest one. 
excuse me. And this is a 40 by 50. Everything, by the way, is on clayboard. It's either acrylic on clayboard or um, oil pastel on clayboard or graphite on clayboard, predominantly acrylic on clayboard. And this is the sound between words. And again, I'm influenced by a, a photograph that I'd seen in media of an actor and I was really engaged with the space and did a whole painting that included that jumping off space. And I'm playing around with the idea of connectivity and disconnectivity is, is he listening and he's one step out of the conversation or is he coming or going, hopefully inviting the viewer for their own interpretation. Let's see what else we have. Sorry about the fast spin, don't get, don't get car sick. And here's one of the, whoa, that really came up, 20 by 48, let's see. And I'm playing with the idea of storyline of two different rooms and spaces with the different times that this, whoops, it's sometimes hard to move these things around. There we go the different time zones that this guy is experiencing in this one space that's both kind of the same, but separate. And let's see. Let me spin back out a little bit. And then I've got another three pieces that are related in the show. These are 12 by 12s. And this is hard on fire. So I'm working with a particular stage in life where she is in development. She's still part of her background. Her face isn't fully kind of extrapolated from the background and everything is all passion and fire. Maybe we've all been there. <laughs> and then we have the middle development which is room for change it's exciting this one was sold sorry about the red dot <laughs> right in the middle of the talk um and i'm working with what has occurred in the space and also what the characters that have been in the space have left us with so that's the question and this is the, the playing around with the middle time in our lives, room for change and what we're about to do with this middle time. And that's the influence of that piece. And finally, we get to the third piece of that little three-part series, which is the long look back and the, the reflection of the prior two pieces and that lifetime. So I also want to show you what I have here, which is a brand new piece. It was influenced by a photograph of this guy's hair, which I was really excited about. So that ended up building an entire painting based on one man's hair. And I, I love to do figures and faces so much. So for me, it was a real treat to just kind of get in here and work on this one guy and his clothing and the greenery behind him and his snake-like tie. This is a 16 by 16. It's acrylic on clayboard and it's this one, which I think may be in reverse. I don't know if it's in reverse on the camera or not, but it looks looks better up on the screen. And then I've got this one, and this is brand new as well. And I've got uh, working on two figures and their conversation or their lack of conversation and back to the idea of connectivity and disconnectivity and which way are they going? Which way are they going? 
What do these hand gestures mean? Is there a discussion or the things that are not being said? And uh, the fruit, I guess, some sort of fruit, the fruit bowl. What, what's, its, um, what's its process? How does that fit? And I'm working as well on um, the curtain in the back, which, whoops, which may or may not have something behind it. So this is the secrecy, the symbol of secrecy, what's behind the curtain. And that's what I've got for today. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so let me make sure I do this right. You're stopping sharing, so I think that's right. Yay, okay. Hit the Perfect. right button, hit the right button. <laughs> Love it, thank you. Thank um, you. Next up, we have Anna Pritzel. Hi, everybody. Um, let me share my screen. Oops, that's not where I want to be, though. Here we go. Um, so I just wanted to start by saying uh, I am really um, want to thank Women in the Work for inviting me to this and that I'm honored to be among the two distinguished artists that I've, I've been chosen to be along with. I'm kind of humbled. So I'm going to talk about my work, Frozen, which is um, part of um, a PhD program that I'm doing at University of Texas at Dallas. And um, I'm gonna run this video while I'm kind of talking a little bit about what the work is about. Um, my research is about women in madness or hysteria um, and about how um, media kind of continues, I believe, to drive women and madness and how women today are starting to own the, the word hysteria. It's coming back and um, women are, are trying to kind of capture that that word itself and um, uh, own it, but also how I believe that the pose, you know, that has been given and handed down to women over the years um, continues to repeat through selfies today and through um, fashion photography. Um, and I'm not sure that it was something that women did naturally or whether it was maybe handed to them by men as far back as hysterical photos um, from the 19th century. So that's that's kind of what my research is about. So this is just kind of a quick little video of, of my working studio. Um, let's go on here. So I the, the project started, um, a few years ago working with his historical photographs, but during the pandemic, when we got sent home from work, I didn't have access to the, the materials and the, the working space that, that I was using at my job and in my studio. So I was working at home and I, was, I, I, I didn't really have anything to work on. I kind of got depressed, you know, when we got sent home for COVID. And so I kind of had an aha moment of, okay, what can, I, what can I be making at home? And I needed to get the camera out. And I started thinking about what can I relate to what I'm doing um, and make work at home? And I started thinking, well, flowers, you know, they're pretty stereotypical. We don't think about necessarily giving men flowers. We think about giving women flowers. So I started shooting flowers and I'll, I'll show you the flower, the flower work. Um, but, you know, I was kind of in a fit of depression and the flowers pulled me out of the depression. They gave me something to work on. Um, and it really fit into this body of work and kind of became the center and the end of this body of work. So, but it started here with these, um, the, the image on the left is an actual famous um, hysteric from the 19th century called, her name is Augustine. And, um, you know, if you look at her pose, this is supposedly a hysterical form, but it looks very sexy and attractive to me. And if you compare it to um, the, the image on the right, you know, it's, it's, it's very alluring and very sexy. So I, this is where I kind of started my research is comparing these images. So this is where my project starts. Lots of negatives. I appropriate the historical images from the internet, um, make negatives, and then I create these images making 
using historical processes, um, meaning imagery. The images in the 19th century were not digital images, obviously. We didn't have that technology. But in the 19th century, we did project, uh, processes like calotype or salted paper prints or cyanotypes. And I decided that my historical imagery would be created in these historical processes because first of all, I'm passionate about historical photography processes. So that's where I started. Um, and so these are some um, examples of the historical processes. Once the historical processes were finished being created, I would then mount them on a piece of uh, cradle board and I would coat them in an encaustic beeswax. And the beeswax serves as kind of an entombment, like a, let's put these to sleep, okay? The, it's time for this, this to go away. Not, not the processes, but this old archetype of female um, and these, this obviously is a contemporary photograph, but I did these poses as well in the old, because it's like, let's, not that there's anything wrong with sexy poses, but where are they coming from? I want women to be empowered to make up their own ideas about who they want to be rather than being told. So we're encasing them in the wax. And then I have a lot of red stitching throughout my the, the exhibition and, and through these pieces that show some of the tortures that have been put upon women, whether it's binding feet or binding waists with corsets. Um, some of them have eyes or mouths sewn shut or are telling or just showing um, directions to look or directing the eye throughout to um, explain where you're supposed to be looking for imagery. And I'll show some shots of the, the finished work in a minute. But, but I do a lot of work hand coloring and waxing to give textures and to, to bring the eye into the imagery to notice certain things about the imagery. And then we get into the flowers, which were what I was working on during COVID. And these you know were meant to be like, okay, this is now kind of my finishing work. So, they're brilliant, they're, they're beautiful, they're vibrant as women are, you know, they are, and, and I didn't coat them in the wax because I wanted them to shine through. So um, I want you to see all the gloss and beauty and brilliance that women are. Um, and they're coated in a resin, an epoxy resin. So you can see they're, they're really brilliant and shiny. And then I did this little video here so you could actually see a resin pour once the images are printed and I print them on a a glossy metallic paper so that they're already really shiny and, and vibrant and then I mount them also to the cradle board like I do the other imagery and then um, I pour this resin on them and um, it just gives it another layer of gloss and I pour the resin really thick and I most people let the resin run off the side and it just gets a thin coat I build it up by putting the tape around the edges. So my resin is about a quarter of an inch thick. So you have this big, thick, almost like a piece of glass over the top that just makes it really thick and glossy. Um, but it also it also gives that appearance that it's it's covered in glass. And, and the glass and the way that these images are under this, this glass and this resin gives the viewer the idea also that that we're still a little stuck you know i think we take a few steps forward and then with row you know we've gotten kind of kicked back a bit so the, it's like women have made huge progress but we're still really stuck so here's our vibrance our vitality but we're still stuck some of the images have this vignette around them um, which gives them kind of a specimen um effect, you know, to be looked at. So I'm, I want that to come through as well. A lot of the vessels around that also you're, you're captured. And then these are just the installation views. You can see that I have a piece of red twine running through. That was a little serendipitous. Um, we hung a piece of string for my, my vantage point for hanging the show. It's the center. And then when I saw that, I thought, well, this is kind of a timeline. So 
the red twine that I used throughout, I went and ran to my studio and got the twine and I thought that's perfect. This is my timeline. And so I ran the red twine through it and decided to keep it within the show. Um, and I, I thought it really worked well. So this is one view. This is the main wall of historical images. And then I put a couple of the colored flowers in the middle as kind of placekeepers. And underneath the flowers, I put quote, well, they weren't quotes, they were quotes by me that just spoke of um, my family and the experiences of my family. And in between the two flowers, those are images mostly of my family members. And I had a lot of mental illness within the women of my family. And I, I believe that my family members had mental illness because they were so kept into these, these spaces that women were kept to, you know, throughout history. And, and they were really these vibrant, amazing women that weren't allowed to shine and be who they really could have been. And so they're in the middle of my show between the place keepers and then to the right here we get into the more contemporary fashion and then a lot of selfie images and then those images bleed down to the bottom here to kind of fizzle out and then we get into the flowers and so then we have the flower views and this is just the most recent exhibition that i did for my my phd um exhibition and I'm still building this work. I'm still working on it. Um, and I'm going to be doing an exhibition in January that will have this work. And then I've made a lot of additional work to continue because I, I want to continue the process and I want to continue the work. So I don't know if I even used, I was trying to rush because I didn't want to run out of time. And I thought, oh, I have way too many slides for this. But that is, that is my work. Thank you so much. Yeah. And next up, we have Angel Faust. Hey, okay, well, hello, everyone. So I'm excited to be here with y'all. Thank you for joining um, on your lunch break. And thank you to my co-artists, uh, shares. I have definitely have some questions for you guys after the for the Q&A. And thanks to women and their work for having me. Um, so I'll just jump right in. I have a, a keynote here. I'm going to share that. Hopefully, you all see the screen OK. Cool. Yeah, it looks great. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, so I am um, a little bit about me. I'm um, in the Dallas Fort Worth area. I grew up in this area. I've been I've visited other places and lived in like Vermont and Portland, but Texas is home and Texas is also a place where it's just rife with inspiration and challenges. And I think my work sort of is um, is steeped in that, given that it's in social practice. And so I'll explain a little bit about some of my work, the community memberships that I have and also how that kind of ties into the work. So I'll just jump right in with that. So I want to start with the Arcacosa project. This is a project that I worked on before the pandemic in 2019. And I forgot to start my little timer, just because I have a tendency to ramble, you know, artists, like we love to talk. If you ask us about our work, we're just going to keep talking. <laughs> um, yeah, so the Arcacosa project started off as a very land-based, place-based um, work. Um, it's in the area in the neighborhood that I grew up in, in the West Dallas area. A lot of people don't know with uh, the river, it was moved three times. And I'm really tying that also with um, the personification of the river as a body of water. And as it relates to my gendered experience as a cis uh, person who is uh, in a transition state. And I also mention that because this is an important part of the work that I'll share with you in the following si slides. Um, but with this work, this is a partnership with Teatro Dallas. They asked me to create a future monument and what that looked like in um, a future monument of the future. And so I chose the Arcacosa River, which is called the Trinity River um, by the colonial standards. But in the Caddo Indians, the indigenous people who lived here before, the river was called the Arcacosa. So I created a future postcard in a way to invite the, the viewer into this world to imagine, 
what if we did have, um, what if we had moved forward with America in a different way versus colonization and the subsequent things that happened like genocide and all that? What if we invite the viewer into imagining a future? And so I'm also looking at how do we look towards the, um, how do we look towards the past to move to the future and including these conversations in with um, how do we move forward with all this information? And so in my research, so as an artist, I'm a very much um, a research-based um, artist. And I started looking around and looking at different places that have created um, autonomy for their bodies of water. So I took this decree um, where the Archicosa is essentially suing the city of Dallas for land rights and eco eco rights to be able to you know manage their waters to be able to have health care and that relates to the you know the Archicosa River as a body of water and, and much in you know here in Texas we're having to deal with that sort of uh, now with the Ruth Row um, and what is what does that look like for us now as 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 for um, as for the river itself? And so I created this um, petition, this de decree, suing the city of Dallas to see for land usage. And so part of the um, invitation, I invite the people who are you know interested in working in the river or you know learning more about it, is I create woodcuts and linoleum prints from these. Uh, projects. And this is actually a view of the Arcacosa at, uh, at night in winter. And there's a, this is a linoleum print that I carved, and I also applied a gold leaf. And so there's a small edition of 10 that I made that also, this print will be featured at the Red Dot um, in uh, Women Are the Work in October, if you're interested. But this is, so this work starts in a very analog state. I've researched it heavily with how the river moves. Um, I what I started to do recently is started to uh, explore digital uh, aspects. And this is a part of a project called uh, New Stories, New Future, curated by Dr. Lauren Cross. And her um, theme was a curatorial theme on inviting people into imagining stories and creating future narratives. And so for my work, I went to the past. I went to the river, um, knowing that it was moved three times, uh, knowing that in giving it voice, the personifying the river. And so this kind of got me thinking to um, kind of, we, as I understand the land, you know, how do we also look at uh, the experiences of being human and in the body and examining intersections um, and telling stories that, you know, for people who look like me and for people who look like, um, who I'm a part of the Latinx, um, like transgendered community and what does land autonomy and body look to us and also how does a labor and and how do we you know live in the world you know because we all have to have a job in this or you know some sort of working conditions right to, to live to sustain ourselves so this project um, was done with workers defense project and i examined when you're looking when we're looking at men's roles and women's roles in construction and housekeeping they're very gendered gendered in, in the way of pay, we know that um, the gender gap is real. And so I wanted to create a piece that invited people to think about what is a gendered, uh, what, is a, what is construction, what is housekeeping? How, how can we look at these two entities as worker, as laborer, as one? And how do we um, start making that conversation of what's well, an engagement? You know, viewing these roles as as one. I mean, it is it is labor, and it's uh, one isn't, and they're both dangerous. You know, uh, housekeeping has chemical products that they deal with, and construction can also be very dangerous as well. And so, I use my work as a also a, a way to you know bring up current events. Like with uh, last year, there was a bill that prohibited construction workers to uh, have water on site. And as you know, in Texas, or those who know, it's very hot. And that's just something that is, you know, like an ongoing challenge with living in this state. So I'm really dedicated to, to being here and place and land and exploring these themes with, with this work. And so just a little bit about the work, because that's probably the most important part, <laughs> is that I took two elements. I took an apron, a woman's apron. In Spanish, it's called a mandil and a construction vest. And I dissected them and sewed them back together. Um, and that was a fun process. Um, with my mom, she was a seamstress and she uh, actually didn't want to show me how to sew. 
because she didn't want me to have that life, um, to have that career. Um, mm-hmm. So I had to teach myself, um, you know, that that skill. And, you know, I, I have to say, I think that I did a pretty okay job. She saw the work. She was like, not bad. The scenes were, were pretty good. Um, <laughs> but yeah, there's also that aspect of, um, I, I consider, you know, what is it like to do women's work? Is it women's work? And as a person who's kind of is non-binary, you know, what does that mean in my practice? And um, so then that I showed this piece at Women in Their Work last year as part of Vicki Meek's show, uh, what we, uh, we know what we, we know who we are, we know what we want. And she had a really great premise of what is, um, what is female work? What does gendered work look like? What is, um, what are the issues? And, and there's a common thread within the theme. And so this work with Workers Defense lined up perfectly with her, um, her curatorial process of showcasing, you know, these kind these demands of, you know, women demanding agency and women knowing what they need in their practice or knowing what they want in their, in their lives and their livelihoods. Um, so with this, this, sorry, with this work, um, you know, with being focused on people moving from the land to people and labor, I was able to work with the Huckabees at Kinfolk House. So that leads me to the, the last part of my presentation where my uh, the newest part of my work that I'm moving more into uh, figurative portrait work as it relates to labor and community. And so this is a great space. This is their ancestral home um, that they converted into a gallery that's in a neighborhood. And I also love this model because it's not your traditional gallery in a sense, but it's also a, a community-based place. I mean, this place is directly in a neighborhood and Letitia Huckabee is and Cedric, they're both very accomplished. Um, I'm just honored to be able to work with them with this project, but their they're call to action or the curatorial proposal, I guess I get stuck with call to action from uh, other like movement spaces, but I start researching the area. I start looking at um, who is in this area because a lot of times with um, these cycles, um, there are different movements or different people who move in, people who move out you know, people who move in and say, oh, there's nothing here. And when really there's just been kind of an ongoing flux. And so that's a part of how I research my, my projects always. And the, one of the focus areas I thought of, of how people congregate, because that was the name of the show, was food. And so not just having a reason to eat um, tacos, which, you know, who needs a reason to eat tacos? I, I don't. Um, but also it's a perk to be able to go in and meet people in the community and also learn kind of why they opened a shop there, their mom and pop shops. These are people who are in these areas before, you know, the new development comes in or, you know, gentrification starts happening and moving people out. And, and so I'm actually living in an area with proposed zoning in Dallas and recognizing that, you know, there are people that live here. And, you know, I really loved interviewing Lorenzo. Um, he, he just, he was just, you know, he looks like a dad manning the grill. And I, uh, <laughs> really was really drawn to to this to his uh, shop and also the rotisserie or the acara asada pollo asada was really really good so i converted this into a um woodcut this is six feet by four feet and it's actually behind me in uh, my studio and these are going up at the oak cliff cultural center uh today after i jump off this call um today and we're, we're installing these there um, but just to give you a sense of um, scale, they're six feet by four feet. I wanted to make them larger than life because a lot of times workers are overlooked. Um, they're, you know, behind the scenes. They're just not uh, present. And also, I just want to make work that also that people from someone in my community would really see this as a, um, just really see this and really absorb the fact that they're celebrated and that they are, you know, important. And so this gives you a scale of, you know, a size. And this is uh, Miguel, who was, uh, and everyone was really interested in having their photograph taken. I just really just went in kind of cold calling or just saying, hey, I'm an artist. And can I take your picture? Can I interview you? And they were just more than willing to pose in their poses with, uh, with their work. Um, and these took a week to carve, which is kind of insane, kind of, kind of uh, intense. 
I won't say insane. It's kind of intense, but I have a really good time working on them. I listen to audiobooks of different history things, just just really get into it. And so I made a map of these corresponding places so that people, you know, I didn't want to make an extractive model of art where, you know, you go into a community, you photograph, you consume, you take, but I wanted to give back in a way and connect these businesses to um, to the gallery so that when people visit the gallery, they could also find a place to have coffee or find a place to have lunch. So then just wrapping up in sake of time, so I definitely want to get to q and I also, so this is the four pieces that I made. It's, they're four by six feet. Um, this is, you know, Lorenzo from Pollo Asado, El Original, which is the original, um, the original. Um, then there's the Fort Worth, Fort Worth Seafood and Black Coffee and um, Tacos Don Miguel. And so that gets me to the last part of my, my work. What I'm working on now is, is combining my, my work with the land, uh, with what the Arcacosa, my work with um, making portraits and thinking about um, identity, place, and gender, and combining these things into and these themes into more um, something that's more personal to me, my experience as someone who's transitioning as a gender, um, gender fluid person. And so this uh, work, uh, I haven't shown this to anyone, so you guys are all seeing this. And uh, this is the first peak of, of the new work I'll be doing in December for uh, my solo show at the Dallas Project Artspace as part of CAD, the CAD art, art galleries here in Dallas. Um, so if you're in Dallas, that's definitely going to be up in December, January. And this is um, also featured at the Red Dot Sale. So if you're in the area in Austin, you can have a chance to see it in person. And that's what I have for you all. Um, those are kind of those are those are actually shavings from my the uh, immense woodcuts that I made. Uh, I really appreciated this floor install. I I thought you know it was just kind of funny to me to gather it all in one space. But also when people visited the studio, they were really intrigued and almost drawn more to this than the cuts itself, which I found interesting because of the there's COVID test. I mean it's it's like it's very much a like a sign of the times. Um, so that's, and so I have some shows coming up with the Arcacosa work at Contemporary Art Center, New Orleans, solo show. And I really appreciate your time and attention with this. And thanks for joining on your lunch break. So that's what I have for you all. And I appreciate the time. Now we'll stop sharing. Thank you. Thank you guys so much for sharing everything. Um, I'm super impressed with all of your work. Um, I just wanted to open up the floor to questions right now. Um, if anybody in the audience wants to ask any questions, um, feel free to unmute and do so. Or if you wanted to put your, um, your question in the chat, um, I can ask it for you. Um, or if you guys have any questions for each other, uh, it's a great way to start us out as well. Well, I, I was going to say I'm blown away by y'all's work and really so excited to be part of this. And I noticed that there is an element of thread in the three of our works, you know, which is really interesting. So I, I'm just I'm just absorbing what you all just showed me. And it was I was super impressed. So thank you for the share on that. Uh, thank you for that as well. I, I really also enjoyed, uh, I've, I've, I have a question, I think, for, uh, to get us started, I don't know if any questions have popped into the chat, but I was curious with Anna's work, what um, what kind of flowers uh, were you particularly drawn to, or if there are any in particular that, that stood out for your flower um, explorations? I tried it. thought I already did that. I tried everything. Um, and I that was part of the learning curve there were a lot of learning curves um you know things like magnolias I did a magnolia but not the same way because if you touch a magnolia it turns brown and shrivels so um you know things that I thought wouldn't work like birds of paradise actually worked beautifully I thought as tropical as they are they're not going to freeze but they did they were stunning so 
I used anything that that I could get my hands on. I would I would go to the grocery store or to my son's best friend's mother as a florist, and I'd go to her and the I didn't show it, but well, it was in one of the installation pieces that I call my heart, and it was this big red leaf that that has a big stymen on it. I thought, oh, I'm not going to do anything with those. She had given me those, and it ended up being one of my favorite pieces, and I've sold one of them, and it's it's really it's huge and uh but some of the things I didn't think would work ended up being the best and some of the things that I thought would be amazing just weren't so like I thought roses would be great which the blue was actually a rose but I had to cut it to get it to look good full roses didn't work so great but yeah no I, I tried everything and I tried them different ways and it was a it was that was a two-year progression of going from one thing to another to learning to how to sculpt them rather than just throwing them in the water and freezing them and learning how to freeze them at different times. And it was, it was, it was, that was part of the, the learning. It was a lot of fun playing with flowers, just having an excuse to fly, buy flowers and have them around all the time. <laughs> you can beat that. For sure. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know if we have any other questions, but I have one more question for Cheryl. Um, as far as your, I noticed that a lot of your subjects were uh, seated on pedestals, and I wondered if you could share more about kind of that um, imagery. That That's a good point. I haven't, that's so funny because I haven't really stopped and thought about that. Um, my first art form was actually as a welder. So I started with sculpture. So the first thing when you say that is I go sculpture. So mm -hmm. it has this just intuitively a sculptural feel, the pedestal to me. Um, and yeah, certainly with the fates and the Greek mythology that I talked about, the, they're on the pedestal. And the, the it brings this kind of more linear seating area in the cube, kind of a containment piece, I think. And also the elevation of the pedestal. So that's... The, it, it, that's a very interesting point, but those are my thoughts about it. Thanks for bringing that up. I'm going to think about that now that I throw all these folks on pedestals. <laughs> What's going on with that? Yeah, it's really interesting. I really appreciated your your work, and yeah, I'm curious to learn more. And happy to know you're in Dallas. So definitely. Yeah. Cool. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, Cheryl. To that, I was wondering too. One of the things I wrote down is you said that that a lot of your things were inspired by just like you saw a hair that you liked or yeah. so are you and you said sometimes you take a photograph and you work from that but do you just work from memory a lot of times by something you saw um my start place is almost always either in media uh and taking screenshots or getting in front of a film that i've got on tv and they they, they won't let you take the still anymore <laughs> I don't know if we all remember when that stopped on Netflix, but, you know, get out the iPhone and, and shoot the pause button or collect from uh, flea markets or my own photographs. Sometimes, yeah, I've actually done pieces that come from studio visits where there's an open studio and people that are very interesting come in and they're usually willing to get their photograph taken and tell me their story. So oh, cool. that's the, yeah, yeah, it, that's definitely part of it. And it's just the jumping off place. Sometimes I stick to the narrative a little bit and sometimes I go in a completely different direction and the curve of a face may be the impetus for an entire painting, mm -hmm. like the guy's hair, the red hair, you know, it's like, Oh, it's moving this way. All right, worthy of an entire painting. Let's go. Mm -hmm. So I use a lot of technology in my work. I'm working on Procreate a lot of times just to do a rough sketch to see how do things work. And then I'll shoot my own paintings and then bring them back and kind of go, what would this edit look like? So it can be a very long-winded technological process that ends up just using the hand. So it's kind of 
it almost sometimes feels like a reversal of some things that I've seen that turn into technology that start as a sketch. I reverse it, bring it back old school. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh. Um, Anna, we do have a question in the chat for you. It says, what are some of the strategies that guide your decision-making processes in terms of organizing your images, your own work versus the appropriated imagery on the gallery walls? You discussed your images of your family that influenced some of your decisions on that one wall. Um, hello, Marilyn. <laughs> she's she's my she's my wonderful committee chair. Um, I'm calling her out. My <laughs> my well, it was kind of chronological. I started with the most historical, like the hysterical women. Um, and then my family, you know, there were images like from the forties and then I kind of moved into the historical fashion, you know, the, the historical fashion photographers and, and then there was just a mix of everything, but I separated my family, family from everything. And I wanted those place markers with my flowers to separate my family because they were more precious for me, obviously, because it was personal. And then the the things that I wrote under them were very personal for me. So it was kind of a place for the viewer who was reading from, if they started, left to right. Um, you know, you stop at the flower and it's like, why is this here in the midst of all of these historical processes, these monotone, waxy things? And then you stop on this very shiny, glossy photograph and then there's text under it why is this here and it was really they were like bookends to this very personal section about my family in the middle and the, the writing was about acknowledging my family in the middle of all of this this crazy I mean and it was it was I, I think all of the images are beautiful whether they're hysterical women or all women are beautiful. <laughs> I don't want to say they're not, but my family per particularly is special to me. So I was kind of acknowledging them. And that's how the, the colorful flowers got put in between as bookmarkers or place markers for their, they, this is a special place in the middle here. And, and the rest of these, these images are, are not, are, they're, they're special, but they're not these special. So that's what that and the, the rest of the arrangement was kind of like a, you know, it was it was put together as a salon style. And, and, and it was I tried to keep it from the oldest to newest ish. And then they were, you know, fitting them size wise. You know, this goes here because it fits the size. And, you know, that's kind of how it worked. It was like putting a puzzle together. And it took a lot of time and work. It was because there I had over 200 pieces. So it was a, just a labor of love. Yeah. Thank you. Um, Angela, I, I actually have a question for you. Okay. Oh, um, that's sorry. <laughs> uh, I am super intrigued by your work because I have a design background and research is like largely important in everything that I do. Um, and I'm wondering as you move through your exploration of gender and um, you seem to be focusing more on yourself and this new um, way that you're going. Um, based on the emancipation of Angel, which is a great title. Um, I wanted to know how research play into that and like how you'll change your um, methods based on now it's something that's personal. Not that it wasn't before, but now it's something that is like largely based on you. Oh, yeah, you know, I kind of zoned out and I realized that you're asking me this question. <laughs> <laughs> Was listening. Um, yeah. So how um, how how will it change? So that's that's a good question because I took a lot of uh, personal photographs of my transition of the surgery and how and that was the very beginning of of that how I looked at um, how I looked at the bot my body as a as a terrain and so I started thinking about I definitely don't want to. Uh, share something that would be traumatic for someone else. So I'm very thoughtful of how I present my image. And to me, making this this work in a way that was more um, 
like with this, the, the, cult, the new piece, the work, this piece that I'm working on right here, um, to retranslate that in a way that wouldn't be re-traumatizing to someone else, but also would inform other people of maybe what gender dysphoria feels like and what it might look like if, if I utilize color and in a way, and also that I'm very cognizant of not making it, um, not, um, in, yeah, to make it an invitation, not to um, read, yeah, basically not, I, I don't believe in trauma dumping, right? Or just being very, um, very intentional. And so, that's that's one of the ways I, I it's a very I guess it's a very edited and curated process so there's a photograph reference and then I'm re repurposing it in a way that is more generalized for people to view and have an idea of what gender dysphoria might feel like and it's actually in focusing on the joy that's what I was trying to get at focusing on the joy of this experience of of you know what it is to to finally be feel yourself in your body and you know, and with the Archicosa work, just really quick on that, the Archicosa work, you know, when I personified the river and I connected with the river, because it's also an invitation to connect with the water, you know, but I realized that, you know, once, you know, she had been moved, just similar to where I, I realized that I wanted to transition as a young person. And that was in 19, geez, like 19, I think 89, I guess, when I realized I was like, oh, I'm going to be a girl like that's not that's not fun like Michael Jackson there was you know there was a uh, Prince and there was a uh, what's the other like you did Faith George Michael I thought there are other options here so I think had I had that technology or that wisdom and that knowledge I think I probably might have transitioned um sooner so so with that with with the bodies of water I know that's kind of a like loose connections but that's how I think about it is, you know, if the Archicosa could decide where to move and flood, similar to where she decided today, I mean, she flooded and she's almost at the top of the levees. Um, I definitely think of pop culture, the environment within this new work, the emancipation angel. So I hope that answers your question. It's kind of a little, you know, it's a, it's definitely still working, a working idea. So thank I appreciate yeah. it. It definitely did. Thank you for that. Baz, I wanted to ask you too on your on your earlier work. Where did you? How did you choose those projects? Were you just? Did you feel a connection to the water, the river? How did you? How did you connect to those original projects? Yeah. So that um that work started with um. So I was working in twenty seventeen on gentrification. Um, there was a, a big changes in in my neighborhood. Um, and so I started looking at uh, the land itself. And so with, with that particular project, I realized that I didn't have a connection to the river. And when Teatro Dallas, their theater company, and I also want to mention we'll be doing a play on their Cocosa next spring uh, based on this work. So it's like a, I really love community partnerships and really in community connections. So they created this uh, future monument and invited the idea to be, to be born, to be created or for me, at least the, the vehicle, the incubator to say, like to create my own future monument because I didn't have a connection to the river. And, and honestly, so many people live in Dallas and I've never been to the Trinity or, you know, I mean, there it really, there are other cities, of course, like Austin has a great lady, you know, the Lady Bird Lake, you know, connection and there's other places. But, you know, I think it's also, um, I mean, that's really how it started was an invitation to create a future um, postcard. Um, yeah. Oh yeah, and I want to add. It reminded me that by doing that, the city has proclaimed it as a um, as a, a landmark, as the Arcacosa. So it's just uh, showing the power of of these projects or you know these movements that we create. Yeah, thanks for asking. Awesome. Is there anything else you guys wanted to share about what you have coming up um, in the means of like shows or anything that you wanted to announce? Yeah, 
I, I have one more question um, for, mm -hmm. for Anna. I was curious, whenever you're showing your historical images, a lot of the, uh, the hysteric images, um, it seemed like they were very much just really to modern. Um, and it really that hysteria to me, I guess, I guess some thoughts I just want to share is that it just seemed like they were just powerful women and they were just kind of made, you know, made to be or rebranded, I guess, to be hysteric because they looked amazing. Like they look like Lindsay Lohan from like the 2000s or something. Well, Someone crazy, spicy. right? I mean, <laughs> <laughs> pretty much. I think that's pretty much the maybe the way it was is the women that were smart and outspoken were put in the hospital because they were hysterical. Yeah. 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 And then they were posed by the male, by the male doctors and taken photo, they were photographed and that has been handed down to us as these poses is, I don't know, that's, that's kind of what I'm, I'm looking at and trying to figure out. So, but yeah, they, yeah, not all of the hysterical poses look powerful. <laughs> Some of them are a little painful looking, but yeah. Yeah. Understandable. Anna, we have another question for you in the chat. I was wondering how you may feel about flowers being thrown away once they are not beautiful, flesh functional in society. I love that question because here's what's really cool about the flowers. I have a dear friend who's, she's one of my, she works for me at the college. Um, she's one of my student assistants and she takes them once I have frozen them and don't have something left with them because she loves them when they're dead. And I did too. I think they're beautiful. And she photographs these dead flowers in such a beautiful way that they're never really disposed of. So, um, you know, people, I've had people say they didn't like to send flowers because then they just die. And it's like, well, some people appreciate things dead too. I used to collect dead birds and had dead birds in my freezer. And I still would if I, when I find them, you know, I think they're not ugly to me. So yeah, that's, that's a nice, I like that question, but no, they're not really, um, they don't get thrown away in my house. They get repurposed again. So, yeah. I've seen a lot of photographers be very interested in dead birds. <laughs> yeah, dead things in general, I think photographers might be a little weird that way. <laughs> my students think I'm really weird when they hear I have dead things in my freezer. They're like, oh. <laughs> I like that. Well, thank you all so much for sharing and thank you for like facilitating this really great conversation. And we have a couple of comments in the um, chat. Oh, wonderful presentation, such a great conversation. Thank you to all. Um, people really enjoyed the presentations and beautiful and rich conversation. Um, I just wanted to let everybody know that we do have Rachel Wilson Smith's show the future is behind us still showing in the gallery right now that will be up until the 29th um and our video is coming out probably today um so you'll be able to to research a little bit more about um the past present and future in her exhibitions um that'll be on our youtube today and um our red dot art spree is on the 6th of october and is coming up very quickly and we do have tickets live for that so if you guys are interested um i would encourage you to go to our website and and secure some tickets um but that's all i have to share for today i want to thank you all so much again um and you know our facebook live will be up on our facebook page if you guys wanted to revisit this um but y'all did wonderful thank you yeah thank you so much yeah thanks for having me and so great to meet all of y'all too you too. Thank you. Yeah, this has been very inspiring. I'm I'm leaving this super impressed and inspired. So thank you. Thanks for having me. Yes. Thank you. See you guys. <laughs>